you were back there. I can tell. We're in Esther chapter 5 this morning. This is the last Sunday in April. And after this morning's study, we have five Sundays left and five chapters in Esther to complete. On the third day, this is the third day after being informed by her cousin Mordecai that there is a threat against the entire Jewish people. She has been asked to intercede on behalf of her people and herself, and she requested that for three days there would be a period of fasting, mourning, and I think in turn prayer. At the close of that period, she would then appear before the king. As we learned last week, if the king does not receive her, it is almost instant death. I know that sounds harsh, but it was the way of the world in the days of the Persians. If you tried to force yourself on the king and he wasn't interested in dealing with you, your life was in jeopardy. And so when she is requested to appear before the king without being summoned, knowing full well that this could be the outcome, she responded, if I perish, I perish. She'll do what she's been asked to do, but there needs to be this three-day period of fasting, mourning, and prayer. That period has now come to a close. So she takes off her fasting clothing and puts on the royal robes. Obviously, this would be a very expensive, no doubt uh, elaborate gown of some sort, uh, fit for a queen because she was a queen. And she stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters while the king was sitting on his royal throne. I thought about that and I think that's pretty common. When we go to a restaurant, I always want the seat facing the door so I can see who's coming in and coming out. And Diane always has to have it because the light bothers her if she doesn't sit there. If you notice in bedrooms, uh, the bed head is almost always opposite the wall facing the door of entrance. You ever wonder why that is? Why you want that position where you can see who's coming and going? It provides at least a minimal amount of security and the king's throne is positioned in such a way that anyone who's going to enter will be immediately seen by the king as they approach. And that's the setting that is depicted here in uh, the beginning of chapter 5. He's opposite the entrance to the palace. She's standing there. He will see her. The question is, what will his response be? Uh, I don't know exactly how many hours have passed. When we talk about three days, three days in the technical sense, 24 times 24 times 24. Is that 72 hours? Four, three, four, twelve, six. Yes? Do you think that we're talking three full days, or do you suppose that we're, we're dealing with uh, the way we generally talk today? Uh, if we did something three days ago, that doesn't necessarily mean that three 24-hour periods have passed. I think when we go to Scripture and read it, and, and this is not significant, I am merely pointing it out because I, I believe it's important to read the Bible as we would read anything else. 
that the communication of God is on our level and he communicates in ways that we understand. And sometimes we can get extremely technical uh, when that may not be the indication. If I said something happened three days ago, I, I wouldn't necessarily mean that it encompassed three 24-hour periods. And I'm not sure that that's the case here either. It's just that they had made this agreement to fast and pray. The agreement has been satisfied. She can take off her fasting garments and proceed to intercede in behalf of her family. And I want you, as you read scripture, to always read it from the framework of how we typically talk in the way we express things, because generally that's the best way to understand it. Moving on, verse two. When the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, I would read it from the screen, but I have to squint a little, and I don't want to do that, so I'll just look down here. She won favor in his sight. He saw her, and immediately uh, he's okay with it. Now, how long has it been since he has summoned her? 30 days. She was, as we would say today, was a sight for sore eyes. And she's dressed, I am certain, immaculately. I'm sure the makeup has been applied to perfection. She is a beautiful young lady, and immediately she captures the king's attention. She won the favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. They're actually base reliefs. Do you know what a base relief is? It's a picture carved on a flat stone. Before photographs were available, uh, this is what was done. And so they're actually base reliefs of Assyrian monarchs on their thrones holding a staff, generally uh, from what it appears from the base relief, about the height of a man, approximately six foot, and on the top there is a golden orb. And this was his way to signal to her that she is permitted to come in, she will touch the orb, and then the discussion will unfold about why she has appeared unsummoned before the king. So he held out to Esther this golden scepter that was in his hand, and Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Now, this may seem strange to us, but this is the way court proceedings in the royal court were handled. And she's following, as they would say today, proper protocol, coming in and uh, responding as she responds to the king's outstretched scepter. And the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you even to the half of my kingdom. Obviously, he knows immediately she's a woman on a mission. She has something she needs Let's just get to the heart of the matter immediately. What do you want? That's basically what he says, but he says it in a way that uh, clearly indicates that she has found favor in his sight and he's receptive to the queen's request. I will give you whatever you want up to half my kingdom. And again, I don't believe that we're to take this literally. This is an expression that essentially says, uh, I am feeling generous, uh, whatever you desire shall be granted. Uh, but it's a typical way of expressing things that conveys this idea of receptivity and uh, a favorable response. You may recall in Mark 6, I believe it's verse 23, that after the dance before King Herod, that he said to Salome, whatever you want, up to half my kingdom. I don't believe that that again was to be taken literally. This is just the way monarchs spoke. Now in Daniel, we confront something similar to this when Daniel interpreted the handwriting on the wall, mine, mine, tikel, you farson. What in the world does that mean? And I would tell you, if he hadn't told us, I wouldn't have a clue. 
But he essentially said your kingdom is weighed in the balances. And you've been found wanting and then went on to say you're going to die. And essentially this night. Well, Belshazzar had offered to anyone who could interpret the, day, uh, the dream uh, a third of the kingdom. And again, if you know historically the background, uh, he was not the literal king of Babylon at this time. Uh, he was a surrogate. The real king of Babylon was Nabonidus, but he was off far from the capital and had been on an extended leave some historians say more than 10 years, and left his son, Belshazzar, in charge. Well, he can't offer up to half the kingdom because uh, that would be an expression that would imply that whoever was the benefactor would have more authority than the other two. And so he says a third, but it's the same kind of thinking. I don't believe that any king is willing to just give away half his kingdom on a whim. But he's using an expression that conveys generosity and uh, don't be concerned whatever your request it will be granted so Esther would have been extremely uh, reassured by the response of the king so he held out the golden scepter that was in his hand and Esther approached and touched it and the king said to her what is it Queen Esther what is your request it shall be given you even to half my kingdom now, I would expect the very next verse to say, and Esther said, here's the problem, this is what you need to do. <laughs> but I didn't write it. And it's not the way it played out. Esther, it seems, had really thought this through. She had taken that period of fasting and praying and mourning and really considered how she would approach the situation if, in fact, the king received her as he as we just learned clearly did so Esther said if it please the king let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king now that's not what I anticipated her saying but she says to King Xerxes I would like you to come to the queen's residence for a banquet. And oh yes, bring Haman with you. I wasn't expecting that either. I would have thought the last person in the world Esther would have wanted to see was Haman. But what's the old expression? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. You think maybe that's at least at part what's going on here? She can keep an eye on him if he's with the king. They can figure out what's going on and uh, perhaps handle it better. So she says, just come, come today to a feast that I prepared for the king and uh, bring Haman with you. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther asked. He's not in the court at this time, so obviously there are servants around. Kings typically did very little for themselves, and so he dispatches one of his sermons, his sermons, his servants, to fetch Haman and let Haman know that he has been invited along with the king, king to a banquet. And you can't help knowing the story to ask yourself, what would Haman's response be? I'm sure this man with a huge head is just getting more and more flated by the the second now inflated by the second because I've been asked to go to a banquet with the king the king and I will be the only guest of the queen it doesn't get much better than this and he's just so sure this is really going to bode well for him so the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared and of course you know as well as I do Esther hadn't lifted a finger she had given the orders and they had been carried out. But when you give the orders, it is as though you've done it yourself. And so it's her banquet. She's prepared it in the sense that she has instructed her servants to make everything just right because the king and Haman are coming. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, and according to historians, 
Persian banquets involve not only sitting and eating the normal foods that typified a banquet of this sort, when essentially your hunger has been satisfied, the food then is taken away, and then there's a time of, of drinking uh, when the wine is uh, served in abundance. And this seems to be the format that Esther is following here. They're drinking wine after the feast, and the king said to Esther, what is your wish? And now it's going to come out. We're going to find out exactly what's on her mind. And if you will tell me, he says, uh, it'll be granted to you. Just let me know what you want, and I'll take care of it. Even again to the half of my kingdom, and it shall be fulfilled. So he's very plain uh, with Esther, you've got my attention, uh, I'm in a generous mood, just tell me what you want, and it's yours up to half my kingdom. So whatever you've got in mind, it won't be a problem, just spill it out. I think that's the way men think, by the way. Uh, let's not beat around the bush, let's just get it down on the table and deal with it. Uh, does your wife ask you, would you do me a favor? And then after you say yes, she'll tell you what it is. Wouldn't it be easier just to say, why don't you go downstairs and get some water and bring it up? I don't need that first question, will you do me a favor? Just tell me what you want and I'll do it up to half my kingdom. Uh, but that's not the way Men and women are just different. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, and I'm not just talking about physical characteristics. We really do communicate differently. That's not a bad thing, by the way. Studies indicate that women use far more words, typically, than men. Uh, I could get in a car with somebody, some, some guy, and drive to Columbus. We wouldn't have to say a word, and we would just be fine. Two women get in a car and they go to Columbus and they don't talk to each other. Both of them are certain that something terrible is amiss, that one is falling out with the other and neither knows why, because that's just the women need to communicate more. And so he's saying, just tell me what you want and let me do it, and so far it hasn't worked. Well, now surely we're going to get to the heart of the matter. Then Esther answered, my wish and my request, so here it is, my wish and my request, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, which she clearly had, and if it pleased the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. My patience is starting to wear a little thin, to be frank with you. I would have probably said, tell me what you want right now, let's get it taken care of. But that's not the way it plays out. And I think the obvious question that we need to address before we go further is this, why drag this out as Esther has done? And there's a follow-up to that, and why bring Haman into the picture at all? I'm assuming all of you read in preparation for this morning's study uh, this chapter in advance. Did you consider either of those questions? Because this is not how I would expect things, if I hadn't read ahead, to play out. I would just expect Esther to be received by the king, to lay her cards on the table, so to speak, and the king to deal with it. I would have never thought about one banquet, let alone two. But that's not how it works. If you go back to 5-4 and, and see the insertion of Haman into the whole story here of her encounter with the king and ask what's going on, you wouldn't be the first to ask that. Uh, the Babylonian Talmud, which is essentially uh, commentary on the law in Aramaic addresses the very questions that I've just raised and the responses are fourfold and I had to write them down because I knew I'd never remember them. Uh, 
she had Haman brought with the king because she was in the process of setting a trap for Haman. The second response is that she wanted uh, him present when she accused him. She wanted to deal with him face to face and level her charges against him uh, before the king. The third response is that she did not want to give him the opportunity to form a conspiracy and rebel. Uh, if he's not present and the king leaves and locates Haman, Haman is going to make some kind of argument, some defense, and perhaps sway the king his direction. Because he did have the ear of the king. We are all in agreement that he is the king's right-hand man his top advisor. And the fourth uh, response is that she wanted to prevent the king from having time to change his mind. And again, this is from the Babylonian Talmud. The, the Talmud actually lists uh, four specific rabbis and, and their four responses, which I just shared with you. But I really didn't see purpose in mentioning their names. You wouldn't recognize them anyway. But they thought it about it a lot and that's their conclusion. I don't know for sure but it does seem strange. It seems strange that she would invite Haman. It seems strange that she wouldn't tell the king immediately. She wouldn't tell him after the first banquet. She has a second banquet as well and in this second banquet she will actually inform the king of her request. So Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. Have you ever had something happen in your life that just really picked your spirits up, lifted your spirits? You just thought, this is one of the greatest days I've ever had, and whatever it was that happened was just wonderful. Just can't get much better than this. I have been invited twice now to dine with the king and queen in the queen's residence. I would say up until this point there would have been no reason for Haman to have ever been in the queen's quarters. The king is very protective uh, in relationship not just to the queen but his entire harem. Only eunuchs are typically allowed on a regular basis to be in the presence of the queen or the harem. But here's Haman. He's been to one banquet and he's invited to another and it just does not get any better. So as we would say, he's on cloud nine. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and this is where Mordecai hung out, and we've talked about this. Was he actually an official in the government? And this is where some government business is carried out? Or is this just the hangout for old men who have little else to do but sit around and discuss affairs of state and, and answer questions from inquirers, which was very common uh, throughout biblical history for men as they aged to congregate at the uh, entrance, the gates of the city, and uh, it was there that business was transacted and the book of Ruth, and that's going back to the days of Judges, uh, illustrates this, uh, you know, in a wonderful way. Now, some of the ways they carried out business uh, really don't make a lot of sense from our perspective. Uh, Boaz took off his sandal and gave it to the near kinsman to seal a deal where the near kinsman says, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to accept my option to claim Ruth and the inheritance. Uh, I'll pass on that because it will mess up what I already have. Uh, you can play the part of the near kinsman. And, the agreement was sealed by Boaz taking off his sandal and, and giving it to the near kinsman who isn't named. Can you imagine sitting in Tim's office and, and, and you finalize some legal contract that way? Oh boy, what a can of worms that would open up. <laughs> uh, he doesn't operate that way. 
because this is the 21st century and we do things differently, but that's how it was done then, and it was done generally at the entrance of the city. And this is where Mordecai is, and Haman passes by, and he's a man of power, influence, a man of real stature. What do you typically do in settings like that when someone enters a room or comes into your presence? At one time, when a woman entered a room, all the men stood. That was just what you did. Now when she enters the room, somebody says, woman, go get me something. It's a different world. But I would like to harken back to the way it used to be, to be quite frank with you, when, when women were respected and men demonstrated that respect and, and there was a clear difference between males and females. Uh, there were just things that women did not do. They didn't use salty language. You didn't use bad language in their presence. And today, women can be far worse than men in terms of the language they use. And if you don't know that, you must not be getting out very much. Sadly, that's the case. The good old days had some good things about it. but. At any rate, the, the typical response would be to, to stand in the presence of someone uh, that is in a position of great power and uh, authority. Mordecai doesn't even nod. He gives, he gives Haman no attention at all. And of course, again, you have to ask the question, why is this? Now, if you read Romans 13, You'll find that Paul says to Christians that uh, we render, render honor to whom honor is due. Uh, there is a clear demand to demonstrate respect for authority. Uh, that's a New Testament injunction. Romans chapter 13, where Paul is saying the powers that be, civil authority is ordained of God. By that, God understands the importance and the need for civil authority to govern society. And he says to people of God, we need to respect that. Jesus was essentially saying the same thing when he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, to God the things that are God's. But we're dealing right now at a time when Judaism is the rule of law for Mordecai. And the Jews essentially held to the idea that you show your respect to God uh, and certainly not to someone who is godless, someone who flaunts the will of the Creator. And it may be that Mordecai looked upon Haman and thought he's a man that deserves no respect. He gets no respect from me. And this was true throughout the whole story, by the way. This is not the first time that uh, Mordecai and Haman have crossed paths and Haman left an unhappy camper. Uh, you may recall that she is before the king to find a way to deliver her people from imminent destruction, which was brought about because earlier Haman had not received the respect he thought he deserved from Mordecai and his great dislike, hatred for Mordecai led him ultimately to want to destroy the entire Jewish race. It's hard to imagine a man who would fall out with another man and not, not be content just with destroying his enemy, but he wants to destroy anyone attached to the enemy. And for Haman, Mordecai is the enemy. And since he's a Jew, that means all Jews must die. It's a strange situation. Here's a man that's on top of the world and just gets pulled down by a single insult from his perspective that is so great that all of the good things in his life mean nothing in comparison to the simple fact that Mordecai won't give him what he believes is his due. 
I've uh, you know, read a lot, as many of you have, uh, over the last several years about uh, the rise in violence and how it seems that some people have no respect for life at all. And if you diss me or disrespect me, my response is just kill you. And I've, I've lost track of how many stories I've, I've read about someone who kills someone else because he dissed him, disrespected him. Almost always males, but not exclusively. And you wonder, how, how could you be so angry and so vengeful just because somebody doesn't pay you the respect you think you deserve? It still happens. And that's what's going on here. And Haman's response to Mordecai's lack of response is so overwhelming that all the good things that he has in life mean nothing as long as Mordecai is alive. He did not rise. He did not tremble before him. And therefore, he's filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. And he sent and brought his friends and his wife, Zeresh. So he has been invited back to the queen's quarters for a second banquet. He's on top of the world, but as he exits the gate where Mordecai sits, he doesn't get the respect that he thinks he deserves from Mordecai. And so his bubble is just burst. Doesn't matter about all the good things. All he can think about is one Jew who didn't stand. And so he goes home. He didn't take further action, but he intends to. He goes home and he surrounds himself with his wife and with his friends. And this is very typical of what we do when we are in a predicament. We surround ourselves, if we want help, by the people we think that are there to help us, and usually will tell us what we want to hear. Uh, we don't typically go to people that we don't have confidence in. Uh, if we have doubts about the instruction or advice they give, we will tend to shy away. Remember when Jehoshaphat and Ahab were going to form this alliance against the common eerie enemy, Syria? And Jehoshaphat says, we need to find out what God says. Do you have any prophets? And Ahab says, we've got 400. And so they're summoned, and every one of them assures Ahab, if they go to battle, they'll be victorious. But Jehoshaphat is reluctant to take their word. He says, is there another? And yes, there was another prophet who had not been invited to weigh in on the situation, his name was Micaiah, and Ahab said, but I hate him. I think the same kind of attitude, maybe not quite as severe as Haman has for Mordecai, Ahab had for Micaiah. Why is that? Why do you hate him? He never tells me good, which is roughly translated. He never tells me what I want to hear. But Jehoshaphat says, I want to hear from that man. He is sent for in the process of coming before the kings. He's informed of what the 400 have said. But he says in response, as the Lord speaketh, thus shall I speak. But when he comes before the kings and they ask, what should we do? He said, just go. And you'll do fine. And immediately Ahab is upset. How many times have I told you to tell me the truth? He there was something in the manner in which Micaiah delivered the message that clearly implied to Ahab that he wasn't being serious. Not the words, but the mannerisms. That's why communication is much better face-to-face -face than it is over the phone or in a text or even in a letter. Uh, you need to be able to, to hear and see uh, the one that you're communicating with for communication to work best. And it was clear that though Micaiah said what Ahab wanted to hear, he said it in such a way that Ahab knew that wasn't the case. And ultimately, Micaiah says, if you go, you're going to die. That's just it. 
Well, Ahab thought he could avoid that by dressing like an ordinary soldier. And just by chance, one of the Syrian soldiers drew his bow back, released an arrow, struck Ahab in the back, thought it was just another soldier because they get orders, you just go after King Ahab. And they started after Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat essentially said, I'm not Ahab, so they broke off that engagement, and just by chance, Ahab was wounded and died. And I, I think about that, and I, I think about how could a king feel that way toward the, the man of God? Just because he didn't get to hear what he wanted to hear. Haman's at home, and he surrounds himself with people who are not going to tell him anything he doesn't want to hear. They're going to give him the kind of advice he wants which is essentially, do whatever you want, whatever you think is best. So Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, and later we'll learn that that was ten, the number of his sons, all of the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. He, he had, uh, essentially said, my life is great. Look at all that has happened that is just so wonderful. I've got a big family, and according again to historians, the Persians measured a man's success uh, by his physical abilities, especially on the battlefield, and by the number of sons that he could produce. And he says, I've got ten sons. That's a pretty, pretty good uh, outcome. And uh, I've got a position above pretty much everybody else in the kingdom except the king. Uh, life is good, but and there's the problem. Then Haman said, even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast. She prepared, and tomorrow also I am invited by her together with the king. And then he says, yet, or but, all this is worth nothing to me. Everything that has happened, and it's been really positive, he says, means nothing. As long as Mordecai the Jew, sitting at the king's gate, doesn't give me the respect I deserve, is the implication. I see him sitting there. He doesn't stand. He doesn't bow. He doesn't acknowledge in any way my superiority. And it's eating him alive. I don't think any of us are ever going to find ourselves in a similar situation. But I think we can let little things that in the great scheme of life don't mean all that much eat us up just like Haman allowed this slight infraction on the part of Mordecai to ruin what otherwise from his own lips was a wonderful life. This one minor little thing. And he couldn't get past it. I've known people like that. I knew two brothers in Christ that did not speak to each other for years. And it was because one Sunday morning one came into the building, the other didn't acknowledge him. Well, if he's not going to speak to me, I'm not going to speak to him. And it went on for years and years and years. Such a silly little thing. And this is really a silly little thing. Given everything that Haman has experienced, the king has promoted him to top advisor. Uh, he's wealthy beyond our comprehension, it seems. It doesn't matter. He says, as long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife, Zeresh, and all his friends said to him, let a gallows 50 cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Uh, historically, the Persians did not hang people the way we do, or did. I don't think we do that anymore as a nation. But there was a time when that was the means of execution, uh, death by hanging. Uh, 
Certainly in the British Empire, that was the case for a long, long time. But what they did in Persia was uh, impale a man on a stake. And it would be closer to crucifixion than to an actual hanging. But that probably would not have registered like this registers uh, hanging, hang him high. Uh, that may be where the expression originated, hang him high. Uh, a gallows 50 cubits, uh, that's 75 feet tall. Uh, what they're saying is, make a spectacle of him. Impale him so all can see. Now, how they were able to get a 75 foot tall uh, platform where Mordecai could be impaled overnight is pretty hard to wrap your head around. And so some have suggested that Haman probably had a house on the wall of the capital at Susa or Shushan, and from the ground uh, to the top of the wall and then to the top of the uh, gallows may have been 75 feet. I don't know. Just throw that out for you to consider. But at any rate, that's their advice. And, and then when Mordecai is dead, uh, then go joyfully with the king to the feast. And the idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. So we still don't know how Esther is going to secure the freedom of her people. But we do know there's a, another banquet coming up. And uh, something's going to happen really remarkable in the interim because next week, God willing, we're going to find out that the king had a sleepless night. And when he couldn't sleep, what did he do? He read. And what is he reading? He's reading the chronicles, the historical documentation of his reign. And he discovers something rather remarkable that in fact was... Uh, an event responsible for saving the king's life, and yet the king has done nothing to honor the one who saved him. And so he determines that this can't stand, something has to be done. But what do you do? Well, if you're a king, you don't answer your own questions. You get your wise advisors to tell you what to do. And so next week, he's going to summon his most trusted advisor and get his take on what the king needs to do to honor someone in a really special way. And uh, it is just such a powerful story. And I don't know why people don't read Esther frequently. It, it's just, I have to use the word entertaining because I know the Bible wasn't written to entertain us, but it's entertaining, it's exciting, and it is a marvel, marvelous demonstration of how God is in control. He takes care of things. They always work out for his people. One way or the other, they always work out. I did hear the bell. We'll quit for this morning and read chapter 6 between now and next Sunday morning. And uh, come back and we'll continue the saga of Mordecai and Haman. You can talk now too.